What is up, internet? This is Alvin Teaches Poker, and today, after a little bit of a vacation, I am back doing what I love to do, analyzing poker play between the best players in the world played at the highest stakes of the game. Today, we're looking at a massive 2,000, 4,000 blinds, 4,000 ante, with an 8,000 straddle, played at Triton Poker between some of the gods of poker, including Ike Haxton, Jungle Man, Linus Love, True Teller, and the legend himself, Tony G. The action kicks off and Linus Love raises to the absolute minimum with an effective stack of 588,000 euros behind. You know, only half a million euros, nothing fancy. And it folds around to Ike Haxton, who defends the big blind with King Jack. Now, in my preflop model, I have Linus opening about 15% of hands seven-handed, and this may be a little bit too loose, because Linus is only 588,000 deep, and he might be folding some of his hands that have poor implied odds, like pocket fours or eight seven suited. Or, it's possible that this might be way too tight, because the big blind is Tony G, who's probably going to be considered the most recreational player at the table. So before I go on, I'm just going to openly admit I do not know what percentage of hands Linus Love is going to be opening. Similarly, that means I don't know what hands that Ike is going to be appropriately defending. I assume that in the moment these players are going to have better reads on what is going to be the optimal defense versus what players are raising. In the moment Ike is going to be able to tell how loose or tight Linus is opening when he min raises from early position. So it's much more likely that the defense is going to be correctly tailored to whatever the opening range is. So the first thing I want to say is I've tested this model across a bunch of different opening ranges generally keeping twos and threes on the skimpy side for Linus's early position raise. I think that's going to be pretty standard, especially short stacked. It's possible that he never opens fours or five four here. But again, the presence of Tony G makes these ranges a little bit more of a wild card because it's possible that ace jack offsuit, king jack offsuit are going to be 100% opens when the big blind is on the recreational side. And if you've been watching Triton at all, you see that Tony's been donking a ton of pots, even multi-way, so he's definitely going to be considered the guy splashing around and having a good time. In general, if you are unsure about the preflop ranges in a position, again, I would start with some kind of approximation of GTO, and then test your results across various preflop ranges that are tighter and looser than optimal, and if you find that your strategies are going to be generally robust regardless of the preflop ranges, looseness or tightness, of course within a reasonable range, then it doesn't really matter if your preflop models are a little bit off. However, keep in mind that solvers are definitely pretty coverage sensitive, and you're going to get very different results if you add in twos and threes here, and then take out some of these other hands. Generally, if you give a player all combinations of sets in one model, and few combination sets in another, it's going to be very much comparing apples and oranges. So in these models, we're going to assume that twos and threes are not going to be there in 100% of their combinations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That gives action ask you one time a day, you just do it. Yeah. And you just yeah, hope for the <laughs> With this entire range, I should go ahead and check. And this is a spot where Linus should definitely bet the majority of his range for a little bit more than half of the pot. Should almost never size up. And he definitely can afford to have a checking back range with some of his ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jack type hands. Which he then defends by occasionally checking back jacks, tens, nines, eights, etc. Ace eight of diamonds is a pretty slam dunk bet, even though for coverage purposes you'll see that some of the higher suited aces check back and play their hand for their showdown value. That is, ace king can actually check back and win unimproved, so that's a hand that can stand to go ahead and check back the flop much more often than a hand like ace four suited, which is probably going to check back and win at showdown a lot less often. When you're analyzing hands, it's important not to get focused on just if big pots were played correctly. I actually find it really intriguing and really reinforcing of a lot of basic concepts to realize, oh yeah, ace-king of diamonds here should be a check a little bit more than, say, ace-two of diamonds, which should be a majority bet, but should occasionally check because it has a little bit of showdown value. But then a hand like ace-five, which has almost no showdown value, should definitely be a bet. 
So Linus bets 52%. And then the first thing that we should notice is that Ike is definitely going to struggle to meet the minimum defense here, simply because after calling so wide pre-flop, facing the less than effectively minimum pre-flop raise size, Ike is going to be forced to fold a huge part of his range. When you are raising really tiny pre-flop, either your opponents are going to have to fold to you way too much pre-flop, or they're going to have to fold to your continuation bets way too much post-flop. Here we can see, for the most part, King Jack with the King of Diamonds is just going to be a fold. It calls just a tiny bit, which probably indicates that if this solved down to zero, this might just be a majority fold. But it probably also indicates that calling with the King of Diamonds, Jack of Hearts, is probably indicates it's a very small mistake, if it is a mistake here. But it definitely should be the majority fold. Six or seven. Should bet more, he's still caught. No, no, no. So I calls. The turn is the Jack of Clubs, which now brings in some backdoor club draws. And Ike should start by checking his entire range. We can see here that the turns that Ike is going to want to lead are going to be the 4, the 5, and the 6, the boards that bring in the straights and pair top pair, which are probably also going to be the turns which Linus Love is going to want to check back a lot of his second best hands on very often. So that makes a lot of sense. Ike checks. And here, though it seems like Ike should actually not really have that many jacks, this is not a board that we really want to continue to smash. For the most part, we want to continue betting a normal size. We want to check back very, very liberally, especially when we have pocket pairs like nines through sevens. And when we look at our diamond draws, we actually see that not all of them are very clear bets. Ace King of Diamonds is definitely a check on the turn because it can show down and win. But hands like Ace 10 through Ace 7 definitely don't mind checking back some frequency of the time. Especially now that a 9, an 8, or a 7 might not be able to hit a winning hand on the river. Interestingly enough, the boards that we want to overbet the most are going to be the 7 of hearts and 7 of spades, for a reason that I have to be honest, I simply do not comprehend, and I'm very, very open to hearing why people think that this in particular is the best board to overbet, and it's definitely not because it has some kind of giant equity advantage for us, right? The ace is by far the best card for us, so it's the board that we want to bet the most often, but it's not the one that we want to size up on. In fact, the 7 and 8 are not even the highest EV over cards for us on the turn, so pretty interesting that it prefers that these cards to be over bets. Going back to the Jack of Clubs turn, if we look at the EV between betting a normal size and checking, we'll see that it's almost negligible with a hand like Ace-8, Ace-7, or Ace-9. Calls, hits the top pair on a turn. <laughs> <laughs> Two point seven. One more round. So Linus checks, and of course for the drama, the river brings in the Jack of Diamonds. Because Ike really shouldn't even have that many King Jack off suits here, I'm gonna have to turn off the proportional to weight option so we can see what kind of bet sizing it prefers here in Ike's shoes. Here, given the option between three sizings, a small over bet, eighty percent of the pot or a third of the pot. The solver prefers using a third pot size bet the majority of the time, even though when you turn off proportional to weight it seems like the over bet is the majority option. But here, most of the time you show up with 7s through 10s, and a pretty small value bet is all you need here. Here on the river you can see that a bunch of nut flushes check to the opponent, so a solver is really really good at mixing up his river flushes into both bets and check races on the river, so you can't just close your eyes and thinly value bet him with like pocket sevens here. And here we indeed see fearing a check back sevens, eights, and occasionally nines can go ahead and check back the river, especially when they don't have a diamond themselves. So here Ike sizes up, and now obviously Linus has to go ahead and raise, but it's kind of interesting to see what combinations the solver chooses to shove versus to raise versus to call. So first off, sometimes the solver just calls here with Ace-10 of Diamonds. 
Ace Queen of Diamonds is always a shove, and Ace King of Diamonds is always a small raise. Now, I definitely understand why Ace King of Diamonds is going to be a small raise. It's because when you have the King of Diamonds yourself, it actually really prevents your opponent from having the second best hand very often. And so that definitely might be some of the reasoning behind shoving Ace Queen of Diamonds, is that it allows your opponent to have the King of Diamonds here. But then why do you just call Ace Ten of Diamonds? I honestly don't understand. Here with Ace Nine, Ace Eight, and Ace Seven, it seems to vacillate between shoving all in and raising 3x, and so when Linus raises to 4x here, it's definitely going to be totally acceptable as long as he picks a size between 3 and all in. It's going to be pretty similar to the EV of whatever this equilibrium is. Here, Ace-5, Ace-4, Ace-2 all ship. And shipping these hands makes a little bit more sense to me, simply because if you have a 5, a 4, or a 2, you're blocking a lot of your opponent's floats on the flop. And having a 5, a 4, or 2 just makes it more likely that your opponent has like a 6x or a hand like pocket 7s by the time you get to the river. 260,000. 260, On this river facing any size raise, Ike definitely has to call off. So there's really nothing Ike can do to avoid losing a huge pot after he floats with King Jack and somehow gets there by the river while holding a diamond. I mean, check calls the flop. Wondering if Linus could potentially value raids with a worse hand, like Queen Jack, Jack 10 occasionally. Not sure if that's realistic, but definitely going through hacks in his mind. He does think that Linus Love would bet the turn if he had a set. So it's unlikely that Linus has a full house on this board texture. Would Linus check back a flush draw on a turn? It's reasonable, but the most likely hand that wouldn't would be the ace high flush draw. Voting the king of diamonds does block some flushes. Definitely going through Haxon's mind. Yeah, I Does make the call. Again, seemingly a standard hand but understanding all of the mechanics that are humming underneath is extremely important to being able to replicate this kind of high level play over the table when you don't have a solver in front of you. Hope you guys have been well. Happy holidays. I'll be doing some more analysis of some of these amazing Triton hands. And as always, please leave your comments below. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Peace out.